Good morning. Should I? Or? Okay. <laughs> Good morning. So, scripture today is from 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 15. Please stand. <laughs> okay. You then, my son, be strong in grace that is Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to rely, to trust, no, wait. <laughs> many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach each other. Join me in suffering like good soldiers of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civ civilian affairs, but rather ties to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive a victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive the share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended, descended from David, this is my gospel for which I am suffering even to a point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is, Christ, that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people that of these things. Warn them before God. Warn them before God against quarreling about words, if it is no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. You may be seated. Well, it was probably, perhaps, well, perhaps the most um, effective advertisement that was ever written. Here it is. Do you remember this? Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in the event of success. This advertisement was put in the, in the early 19th century by Sir Ernest Shackleton, the famous South Pole explorer. And in his own words, he said, after this announcement put in the paper, it seemed like every man in England wanted to accompany them on this journey. Does that look like something that would inspire people to want to do it? Hazardous journey, long months, complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, and yet men came by the flocks to join the adventure. Well, it reminds me of, a, of an announcement, not quite an advertisement in the same way, that Jesus put out to his disciples. In Matthew 24, or 16, 24, If anyone desires to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This was the... Um, the incentive that Jesus gave to his disciples shortly after telling them that he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to suffer and die. And then he said, if anyone to follow me, let him take his cross. And guess what? They went with him to Jerusalem. They chose to go in spite of it. And let me, let me tell you something. When the leader is expecting to go and die, what is it? Followers. <laughs> It didn't look like a good outcome, perhaps, for the followers if the leader was going to die. And they went. This was an incredible announcement, and yet this is the beginning, was the beginning of what we celebrate today, isn't it? Jesus went to Jerusalem, and he did suffer, and he was crucified and died. And many of his disciples, uh, we know that they, uh, they followed him. We know that, uh, that they ran away. We know that they denied him. We know they doubted. We know they struggled. And yet every one of them, except for Judas, became a man of character and a man of faith who made an impact forever on the world for Christ. In fact, the reason that we're here today is because of those disciples' obedience to this call, this outrageous, this unreasonable call that Jesus asked them to come and go to Jerusalem with, with him. 
And almost every one of them suffered and died in a very horrible way. Some very similar to what he, in the way he did. Well, our text today is Paul issuing the same kind of call to the next generation, to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he said this in the scripture, Fix this picture in your mind. Jesus descended from the line of David, raised from the dead. That's why we're here today. That message was still the most powerful message. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. It is the hope that we have. It's the hope that they had. It is the hope that makes it possible for us to live in this world. In a crazy, mixed up, messy world. Is the fact that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, there's some things in this passage that we want to break down that, that Paul challenged Timothy, and, in, and I think in the same way challenges us. These are some things we want to look at today, kind of a, a different kind of Easter message, but a challenge for us as we move forward in the faith. The first thing that he says is throw yourself into the work. i got a, a question today. Do you throw yourself into the work of the gospel? I know a lot of people who throw themselves into their vocations. They throw themselves into their hobbies. I know a whole lot of other people who throw themselves into sports and leisure activities or making money or whatever it is. But do we throw ourselves into the work that God has for us? I submit to you that the work that we have, the most important thing as children of God, is sharing that message, Jesus Christ is risen, with our world. I know I've probably said this before, but here's the way it's supposed to be. As children of God, that is our vocation. That is our work. Some of you have work at other vocations, and those are things that God has given you as an opportunity to work at your main vocation, which is being a Christian and a disciple. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? God gives you eight hours or whatever your workday is to go and share the gospel with your employees or with your coworkers or with your fellow students or in whatever location you find yourself. God gave you that opportunity, and he expects you to use it in whatever way he gives you to use it for his glory. So, as you think about where you work or where you go to school, are you throwing yourself into the work of the gospel? Are you saying, I am here, I get to make money for eight hours, but my goal is to tell people about Jesus? And I know some of you work in places that you can't do it just the way I just said that, but you can show them, Jesus. You, can, you, can, you know that people get a lot more out of what you do than what you say? You've heard, let me see a sermon rather than preach a sermon. You know, you can say you're a Christian, but when you act like a Christian, that is a message which is so much larger. God intends for us to throw ourselves into that and it goes beyond work. You go, well, I, I work for eight hours or whatever it is, and then I've got some leisure time. Did you know that God would like you to use your leisure time to share the gospel? Can I, can I um, get a little personal for a minute? Because I'm guilty of this too. How much gospel are you sharing when you're doing this? Oh, you can tell me. I'm on Facebook. I'm sharing good things on Facebook. Baloney. Or how about when this, you're on the computer? You know what my guilty thing on the computer is? I'll be honest, it's Craigslist. <laughs> Palouse ads. I'm on there. Wow, I got to have that. Or video games or whatever. And again, I'm preaching to myself right now. I feel just as bad. I'm feeling convicted because I probably spend way too much time on that stuff when I could be using my leisure time to tell people about Jesus in some way, in some, in some manner, in some form. Or if I'm not doing that, I could be reading my Bible more. I could be contemplating the things of God. And then you go, well, I get to sleep for eight hours. How many people actually get to sleep for eight hours? Both of you out there? Okay. Okay. Did you know that if you commit that time to God before you go to sleep, that God can minister to you in your sleep? We're going, well, I'm, I'm not awake. I'm not conscious. God, you know what? God is God. He can do anything. You've heard of the subliminal 
You know, they put a tape in there and, and you learn stuff when you're sleeping. Say, Lord, I'm getting ready to go to sleep and I need a good night's rest. Would you speak to me while I'm sleeping? Would you minister to my heart as you restore my body while I'm sleeping? You know, God can do that. God will do that. But he won't do it unless you ask him. So what I'm saying is we need to throw ourselves every 24 hours of every day, seven days a week, 28 to 31 a month, 365 or so days a year, we need to submit that to the work of the gospel. The second thing he says is pass on what you've heard. I mean, this kind of goes right in dovetail with what I'm saying. It is work. Are you sharing what God has shared with you with other people? This is the way Jesus did it. He made disciples. The way I define discipleship is follow me as I follow Jesus. You know how you can tell if discipleship is working or not? I call it spiritual grandchildren. I've told you this before, but there is nothing that excites me. There is nothing that excites me more than when someone that I've had the great opportunity and privilege of leading to Jesus comes to me and says, Pastor, I want you to meet so-and-so. I just led them to Jesus. That's a spiritual grandkid. That's when we need working. Because, see, discipleship isn't just getting someone saved. It's following through and investing them until they go out and do the same thing. They're so excited about it that they throw themselves into the work and they go and make disciples and, and they share with other people. In the scripture, Paul said, "You want you to take this message and entrust it to reliable men and women so that they in turn can go out and share the gospel of what Jesus has done. Are you passing on what you've learned to someone else? If you are not investing, if you're a Sunday school teacher, who are you mentoring to take over? Whatever your position, who are you mentoring? Who are you shepherding? Who are you investing in so that they can indeed and continue to pass on the story. Well, you've heard this before, right? When the going gets tough, that's not quite what the scripture said, though, is it? It said, when the going gets tough, take it on the chin. I don't know if you've ever been here. Well, that's not a happy-looking guy. When the going gets tough, take it. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He suffered and died for us so that we can indeed continue forward. He said that he used some illustrations in here that I think that we can relate to. He said it's like a soldier. A soldier doesn't get involved in civilian affairs. What a soldier does is they to the orders and the their commanding officers and they do what? They obey. You know, if you had a bunch of soldiers who just wanted to do whatever it is they wanted to do, we'd be in big trouble, wouldn't we? So we understand we are soldiers of God. We need to listen to the commands that he gives us in his word, the direction that he gives, and we need to say, sir, yes, sir. And yet, how often do we go, but God, I don't want to do that. But God, it's hard. I, I know you said forgive God, but, but God, you just don't know what it's like to live in the world. Really? God? Doesn't know? He sent his son Jesus to die for us. The ultimate sacrifice. The God of the universe who created us, who knows us far better than we know ourselves, and we, ask, we act like God doesn't know what it's like. He made this whole mess. He knows exactly what it's like. He never gives us commands. He never asks us to do things that we can't do. The question is whether we choose to. I challenge you, in those situations where it's tough and where it hurts, if you will simply say, sir, yes, sir, and you'll obey, God will help you. He will help you far, far more than you ever thought possible. The next illustration is like an athlete. An athlete goes to win the prize, but the athlete will never win the prize unless they play by the rules, unless they train, unless they work hard. You know, I, I used to love the Olympics now, and, I, and now it gets to where you just don't even, you don't even want to watch them because of all the controversies and all the people who are doping and, and, and cheating and doing all those kinds of things. But the athletes who win are the ones who play by the rules. And the cool thing is, the race that we're running is not a sprint like that guy's running.
right? And the marathon, the winners in the marathon are all those who finish. I know Bloom's Day is coming up in about a month, and I know there's a few people in our congregation who like to go to Bloom Day. And you know why they go? The t shirt. I have got t shirts 25 in a row because I've done Bloom's Day. Not me, I don't do Bloom's Day. When I walk, I want there to be a point to it. Like food. <laughs> Car's broken, I'm walking to McDonald's. It's got to be a reason to walk. Just walking to walk. I can go buy. I have, I had, used to have. And Bloomsday t-shirts. You know where I got them? Goodwill. <laughs> and I proudly wear my Bloomsday t-shirt. No. Play for We do it for not just a temporary prize like a t-shirt or in their day for a crown that would um, made out of uh, perishable leaves, laurel leaves or olive leaves that pretty soon we'd be so brittle it would fall apart. We do it for the chance to go to heaven, the chance to serve him. And one more illustration is the farmer. We've got a few here, so you know exactly what I'm talking about, is the farmer has to go through all of the process and has to do it the right way, or you don't get a crop. You don't go out in spring and plant and expect to harvest the next week. There is time and effort and energy that is involved in the process. So when the going gets tough, we just keep going forward the way that God wants us to go. We keep doing what it is that he tells us to do. We obey. We say, yes, sir. And we complete the race. And we win the prize. The next thing he says is, keep the main thing, the main thing. Keep the main thing, the main thing. What's the main thing? I submit to you, it's this. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you understand if we put this right in the center of our brain all the time, if we look at every circumstance, every situation, everything that we come up against through this filter, how amazing that would be? Do you understand how much this will purify my attitude when people are Knuckleheads, that's my latest word for people, knuckleheads. Because it doesn't sound too demeaning, but it gets the point across. They're just being a knucklehead. What does that mean? Come here, I'll show you. <laughs> this is taking and putting in your heart the WWJD bracelet that so many people wear. It is having this attitude all the time, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So when things happen that I think are, are kind of rough and kind of unfair, if I go, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, you know what? It kind of changes how unfair that looks. For those of you who know it, most of you, we are in the process of remodeling a house. And one of the things that you do when you remodel a house is you buy permits. I'm not sure exactly why you buy the permits, but you do it, and you go down, and the, and the city guy comes in there, and he inspects what you do, and, then you, and he asks you to do something that you haven't done because it, 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 it doesn't make sense to you to do it that way, and so you ask him why, and they, and they say this, code. And there are times when that can get very aggravating. When it makes zero sense up here in the brain, it doesn't make any sense, even to the inspector when you talk through it, but he says, that's when I have to use this verse. <laughs> I will know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And it's okay. There were some lines in here that he put that go along. These are things that we're to dwell on. If we die with him, we'll live with him. If we die with him, we'll live with him. If we stick it out with him, we'll rule with him someday. And this is the one that's kind of weird in the middle, but it says, if we turn our back on him, he'll turn his back on us. This is our freedom to choose, folks. We have to stick with it. We have to stay on his team. The last one is this. If we give up on him, however, 
He will never give up on us. Someone was asking me one time what the struggle is, and here, here's the deal. I believe that when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, he grabs a hold of us with both hands, and he will never let us go. He will never give up on us until our time on earth is done. Because he loves us so much. The next one, he says, is repeat the basics, those ones before that. But I, I was thinking quite a bit about it. What are the basics that we are to repeat? There's, only, there's, there's a few of them, but three of them come to mind. This is it. This is number one. This is the most important. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I like the way this sums it up. God, I first love so this is the basic that we need to repeat to people over and over again. This is the basic that we need to make sure is working in our lives all the time. Is God your first love? Can you honestly say, God, you are my first love? I mean, I mean here's how it's supposed to be. God is supposed to be our first love here, and everything else is, well, even second place is way over here. I mean, God needs to be so far out in first place that second and come into the picture. That's how important it is to have God in first place. When we get to the place that we have that kind of relationship with Him, when we love God that way, it is amazing how it radically will transform everything else that we do in our lives. It really will. If we can teach people to love God with all of our hearts, with all of their souls, with all of their mind, with all of their strength with all of their possessions, with all of their behaviors, with all of their pet peeves, with all of their good stuff, with all of their bad stuff. Imagine what would happen. Then, after we get this one, then we can do this one. Love each other deeply. You see, when I really learn what it means to have God as my first love, then I can understand what it means to love you guys the way that God wants me to love you. Even the knuckleheads. How much do we really love each other? Boy, that's a, that's a hard one. I mean, that's, that's a question that's important. That's a question that we have to answer. How much do we really love? I, I mean, let's, sometimes we don't even love our family too well. Well, I guess we love our family. We don't like them. <laughs> and, and, and we want to try to... If so often we say the church is my family, and that's absolutely true. But let me tell you this if your family and the way you treat and behave in your family is dysfunctional, don't treat us like family at church. <laughs> We're talking about the right kind of the right kind of family love. But I also do know this, that, that with family, I will go to bat for, I will defend, I will protect, I will support, I will do anything in my power to support and love my family. Even when they do things I don't like. God's design is that we would love each other, but not just love each other, we would love each other deeply. Love each other deeply. Then... Make disciples, and I like this last addition on there, make disciples who love Jesus. That implies the purpose of it. That comes full circle back to making disciples who aren't just following me, but they're following me as I follow Jesus. And then we come full circle back to this one is God is my first love. I submit to you there's a lot of things in the Word of God that, that we need to hang on to, but if we will keep these basics in mind and we will work on these first, everything else will fall into place. If we will love God, if we will love each other, and we will make disciples, we're fulfilling the great commandment, and we're fulfilling the great commission all given to us by Jesus himself. I was telling some guys the other day, they said, what do we need to do to be successful, to be successful as a church? And I said, if we'll do two things, we'll be successful. Number one, if we'll really love each other. I mean, that people, I mean in a visible way. I mean, not getting past all of the, the make-believe and the platitudes and the, the chit-chat, but I mean, we'll really love each other and we'll prove it. 
And number two, and these are not in the correct order, but we'll love God the way that God wants us to love him. That when we love each other and we come together, we worship him. You see, that's the way that God knows that we love him. And I think that there is nothing that excites God more than when his people get along, when they love each other and they love him. And it becomes this vicious, wonderful, incredible cycle. And vicious in a very positive way. <laughs> the last one is this do your best. Do your best. That comes back to the first one is to throw yourself into the work. Are you doing your best? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how we want to serve God on the commercials? I remember when I was in college or high school or both. I didn't have much time for TV, but I would do my homework on the commercials. I would watch the show and then I would do homework. You know how well that works? <laughs> Not very well. But how often do we want to have God as an add-on into our lives rather than the main thing? Right? You know, I, I've got my schedule, I've got my work, I've got my family, I've got my stuff, and then I'm going to add church into that. And by church, I mean our relationship with God. We're just going to add a little God in there just to kind of, just to kind of sweeten everything and just to kind, of, to kind of massage my conscience and make me feel better about what I'm doing. Now here, I, I, I'm not hard at all. I'm just trying to, to put it in the right perspective. In this relationship with Jesus, are you doing your best? That's the question. Are you doing your best? I'm not going to describe what that is. Holy Spirit will do it for me if you will pay attention. He will. Do your best. Let God do the rest. And he will. And he will. The word of God, I live, is far more important than the word of God I speak. That's how you tell if people are doing their best. Here's the end. A faith that costs nothing and demands nothing is worth nothing. How's your faith today? How's your relationship with God? On this Easter Sunday morning, when we come together and celebrate that Jesus is alive, it has to be more than just a once-a-year hoopla. I mean, every morning, if it's true today, tomorrow morning is true. Jesus is risen, yes! Tuesday morning at... 6 o'clock or 6.30 when I get up and go to breakfast, and I'm not a morning person, and some of you know that, it's, Jesus is risen. Oh. But I feel good when the bacon comes. <laughs> and Wednesday morning, and Thursday morning, and Friday morning, Saturday. Jesus is worth it. And I found this, and it's appropriate. Since we've been a little bit focused on joy it's semi punnyish The cross is the lightning rod of grace that short circuits the wrath to Christ so that only the light of his love remains for believers. And there's one last thing before we continue. We're going to move into a, a time of prayer uh, as we close our service today. As most of you understand that today is Easter Sunday morning, but it also, it's April Fool's Day. Jesus is risen. No fooling. <laughs> Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege to come together with your church and our family and to worship you and to celebrate the fact that you are risen. So Lord, I pray today that as we've gone through the whole message, that that, that that challenge that Paul gave to Timothy and to the future generations, that the same one that Jesus gave, that we would grasp a hold of it and we would do our very best to make sure that we are throwing ourselves into this relationship, into the work of being Christians. Not accidentally or partially or, or, or sight, uh, just a little bit when it's convenient, but we are doing it all the time. That We are choosing 
as the main focus of our life. Nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So Father, as we come into this time of prayer, if, if you're speaking to any hearts today, I just, I just pray that, well, Holy Spirit, tell us what we need to hear. And if we perhaps are not where we need to be in our relationship with you, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would impress us so strongly that we can't resist it. And as we come together to pray today, that, that we would come and allow you to radically transform us from the inside out. And Lord, if anyone today has uh, struggles and battles and the relationship has perhaps grown cold, I pray, Lord, help them. To make where they leave, that everything is right. And that they are able to keep the main thing, the main thing. Father, for your love and grace. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.